Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. I have a feeling we're going to hear from Dylan on this one, too, so I'm just going to bring up Dylan's <laughs> microphone now. <laughs> Phil, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Now, before we get into the NFL, I want to talk about the SSAC. Oh, my gosh. And what's going on around the state with injunctions and the whole way they classify teams and calculate the points for playoffs, not just for football, Phil, but I understand that volleyball is also affected by this. Well, it was, it was single A, and it wasn't so much. Volleyball works differently than football where, because so many teams play a different amount of games and they're not a lot of common opponents. They do a coach's ranking before you go down to the state tournament. So after the sectional uh, playoffs are over, there should be 16 teams remaining in each class. And then the coaches, those remaining, as, as I understand it, I could be wrong on this, but the remaining coaches say, hey, we're going to rank you guys 1-16. to 16, And then you go on to the first round of regionals. There's no more regional championships. And teams get eliminated from there. The problem came when, and I could, I could be quoting some of this wrong, but on October 28th or the 30th, I got two dates in my head, they reclassified Tyler Consolidated from AA to single A. And then all of a sudden, they're now in a single A section slash region, and there was a lot of hubbub about, well, who do we play? Where do we fit in here? And the way that it shook out was apparently Tyler Consolidated was is a really good team for double A and could possibly dominate in single A, and now they're part of that equation, although they didn't get the full sectional regional experience. Long story short, you have you had three teams you had three teams saying, hey, we have a right to be in Charleston. Tyler Consolidated, the previous double A team being one of those three. So they came up with a solution. They said, okay, we're going to have a play-in game between two of you guys. And so we'll let nine teams down to Charleston for the state tournament. And then the, the winner of that will be the eight seed and go on to play the one seed. And I forget who the one seed is. I want to say it's, it could be East Hardy. Don't hold me to that. But that team said, oh, no, we don't want to play. That's not right. We're the top seed in single A, and you're making us play a power in double A, and that's not right. So there's where the injunction comes in, and there's really no solution. Essentially, everybody that's had to play Tyler Consolidated has screamed bloody murder because they were a double A school up until just a week or so ago. And so that has held up. They have postponed single A, although double A, triple A, and four A will go on exactly as planned. Those kids from single A will not be down there this year. And Dylan, there's uh, something going on in football too. Uh, First and foremost, I guess, if you missed it, Martinsburg was found to have played an ineligible player as well. Dylan, what do you know about this? Uh, All I know is that Martinsburg did have to end up forfeiting one game in a similar fashion to uh, how Spring Mills had to forfeit four games because an ineligible player played against Musselman, apparently. And Musselman apparently now has wins over what most people regard as the two best teams in the state. <laughs> yes, one to nothing wins yeah. against uh, Spring Mills and Martinsburg. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating how that worked out. Didn't work out that way on the field, but it worked out that right. way in the in the ultimate uh, the book there. Uh, and then in regards to the playoff scenarios, this whole thing got messed up back in August when – when they went to four different classifications and they allowed an, an appeal process that would allow you to drop where you had been classified and a whole bunch of teams out of 4A appealed and went down to 3A. And I, I guess, Dylan, correct me if I'm wrong, some of the schools which had scheduled these teams thinking they were 4A and they were going to get a certain number of points for them being 4A uh, now end up playing 3A, a 3A school and they got less points and they are suing because they want the 4A points they originally scheduled, but they're getting 3A points because that's where the team got moved to. Do I have that right? Correct. I think the it looks like the injunction was filed by Wood County. Their board of education filed a petition against the, the SSAC. Apparently, Cabell County had discussed a similar action. And, yeah, you pretty much went down to it. The, the playoff rankings are all, like, formula base so you could just if you as long as you knew the formula you could look at every team's schedule and say okay this school is you know 3a or 2a and they played 
five triple a schools they played two four a schools you know with, with this many kids at at the school this and that and they, they won this many games against these teams and you could add it up and you would come out with the the playoff rankings so these teams basically set their schedules and then right before the season was when they said we're going through with these appeals to reclassify all these schools and then they said okay the new classification our rankings and our formula for the rankings are all based on that now and it was too late to change the schedules so now teams i guess are ranked lower than they think they should be and they want to and some missed the playoffs outright yes uh not in 4a but yeah uh, on other at the lower levels that could that could right. be the case because everybody in 4a has to make the playoffs because there's only 16 teams yep so with the so the injunction filed by the wood county board of education was upheld and then new brackets were released by the ssac reflecting the original math formula pre-demotion of, of, of schools and classification. Mm -hmm. And four teams, Hampshire, Westside, Point Pleasant, and Tulsa, were bounced from their playoff positions, according to this article on Metro News. They were replaced by Capitol, St. Albans, Lincoln, and St. Mary's. Several teams had their initial seats changed as the rating plan applies to all four classes. It is expected that boards of education representing schools that were taken out of playoff position could seek legal action, which could trigger a stalemate that could stall the playoffs before they even begin. So there's some doubt as to whether or not playoff games will actually begin this weekend or not in at least some classifications in West Virginia. Yeah, I believe – I don't know if that would affect 4A or not, but if not, we I know that uh, it came out that the 4A games, I believe all of the Eastern Panhandle schools except for Washington are playing on Friday night and Washington is playing on Saturday night. Now, some are saying the SSAC really screwed this up. The SSAC is saying, wait a second. We operate based on the rules set by the principals of the state of West Virginia. The, I guess they call it the Board of Control or whatever. And we're just operating by the rules they set. We don't invent this stuff and then apply it ourselves. We are following the rules that the principals got together when they made these rules up. Here's how they did it, and it's our job to enforce the rules, and that's what we're doing. We didn't screw this up. That's basically, if I can paraphrase from yeah. what their their thoughts are on this, and they're, I think they're right. I, I don't think, Phil, that the SSA screwed this up so much as the principal screwed it up. I, I don't really – I don't know whose fault it is. I know it's not the kids' fault. And the I, I, I wonder if they never would have went to the silly four classes to begin with if this would even be an issue – but I would throw something in, and and by no means am I an expert in West Virginia high school football, but I think it would impact 4A, 3A, 2A, even if it's not one of the classes that lost teams because of their seeding, because of their ranking mm -hmm. and who they would play. So if they're going to apply that formula to all four classes, for example, Musselman's supposed to go down to play Hurricane. Well, if they go back to the original which I don't even know which is which, but the original that was two weeks ago, Musselman probably would have been. They they were number 10, added a win against Martinsburg over whatever happened there, and dropped to number 12 and because of the new ranking. So Musselman could have been ranked 9, 10, 11, somewhere else other than 12, thus giving them a different opponent. So if you yes. are going to, even though no one lost the playoff position per se, it could impact who plays who in the in the first round. It's just a mess, and it it makes it. it I, I feel bad for all these kids because they've got other sports to start. They just want to play, and you know you, you've got whether it's judges making decisions at the last minute with volleyball and football, whatever it may be. I know it's not the kids' fault. I don't really know whose fault it is, but I know it's not the kids' fault. Rob, before we go on, I think a shout out uh, to uh, uh, to Phil for your daughter. She got quite a bit of recognition this past week for her exploits in volleyball. So well done. Oh, I, I would I will pass that on to her. She may be listening right now. She's yeah. on her way to practice, yeah. but she uh, those kids work and not just Ada. They all work hard in this area in volleyball, and people don't understand or really realize how much effort, time, and effort they put in 
to that sport, and it's a year-round sport, and they they almost never stop. So I appreciate that. We were proud of her for getting that recognition, and she's still got uh, two more days to play. She's focused in on that state tournament right now. Very good. Good. Best of luck to you folks on that. And I'll give you a minute to gloat about the Steelers' win over Washington yesterday, Phil, before we get into financing. (laughs) Go ahead, man. I know you're waiting. Boy, I was – I, was, I don't want to go too much. I was nervous. I was really, really nervous. I thought it was a well-played game between both teams. Had Colin answered the phone this morning, I probably <laughs> would have given him fits. I wouldn't have given him the same leeway I gave Dylan a few weeks ago when the Ravens lost to Cleveland, but I would have given him fits. I'm glad they won the game. It scared me to death. It was a very. I thought it was a good game. I wouldn't say it was well-played on the Steelers' side, but they were gritty and they pulled it out. Tickled to death to be seven and two, and Dylan. Next week, the Ravens are coming to to uh, the black and gold, baby. And That's I don't right. know that I'm going to get. If we win that, I don't know that I can back off of you next week. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. Phil, let's talk. And if they lose, I'm just not calling. <laughs> <laughs> that I believe. Well, let's talk money here, Phil. Right now, the uh, Dow is up four tenths of a percent. S and P futures three tenths. Nasdaq about four tenths uh, uh, as well. And uh, Bitcoin is almost at eighty two thousand dollars right now, which cracked me up because I can't figure out how do you how do you value something that doesn't have any financial value doesn't have any, any intrinsic value. Yeah. And I'll leave the Bitcoin alone, but boy last week with this is the first time I've got to talk to everybody since the election and I had a lot of my clients even say, Well, Phil said you said, you said and they're right, I have said and I've always said that it didn't matter really who was president. But what last week was was confirmation that our markets like certainty. Our markets like knowing the game that they're going to play. So I maintain that it wasn't necessarily because of the presidential election, but it was because the House and the Senate matched that presidential election. And now we can look at it and say, okay, we know for certainty that there won't be any uh, tax increases on corporations, we know regulations will be lighter, especially on banks. Look what what financials did last week. Well, it was a, I mean, it had to be the best week of the year for financials. I know it was the best week of the year for all the equities. But what the business world is doing is looking at how the outcome of that election, they said, we like it. And, then, and we saw that, especially the very next day after, so Wednesday. But to couple that, underlying is something, the old boring story that we talk about, Jerome Powell still cut interest rates, which it was expected. I wondered if they would pause that a little bit just because of the election, but uh, most people did expect that they would cut rates. He did, however, say, look, I'm not trying to – I'm not going to forecast what we're going to do because we kind of live in a different world now. Our bond market reacted to that. So while equities had a really, really good week, our bonds not so much, especially the next day, on the thought that maybe – there may be more inflationary uh, pressures that come our way in 2025, so early 2025. And inflationary pressures doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I want to make sure that you – know, I don't necessarily like inflation, but those things that cause inflation are typically good things, that, that, that uh, a strong consumer, strong jobs, uh, lower taxes, those things cause inflation because people spend money. So inflationary measures may be coming. So therefore, the path of the Federal Reserve – it may take them a little bit longer to get uh, get down to the, the neutral rate that they're trying to get to eventually. But we'll continue to pay attention to the data. So at the end of the day, old boring Jerome Powell, which Rob is going to present a public apology to at some point. Never. He's going to say, <laughs> <laughs> but at some point, they're going to say, hey, we've gotten what we want on the inflation front. And rates are at neutral. And now we can stop. But it's just that path may take a little bit longer. So bond struggled a little bit last week because of that. But, man, what a great week for the stock market. And that, that great week last week now poses risk for this week because we have more economic data coming, and we need it to support what happened last week. We need it to support that fluff that we got, uh, in some cases, 5 6 7 8% return on some indices. Small caps had a banner week last week as well. So now we just need to support it and keep it as the, as the rest of the year finishes out. Before we move from Bitcoin, I, I don't understand Bitcoin. So if, if I buy, if I've got $80,000 I don't need and I, and, I, <laughs> and I buy Bitcoin, 
what have I bought? Have I bought a share of a fund? I mean, what what is it? No, you've you've bought perception and a perception of how much people is going to want to use cryptocurrency, and people's made a lot of money on it. And we we often say because it's not SEC regulated, we're not allowed to discuss it, we're not allowed to talk about it. But everyone is right when they say, how do I value this? And there's no way to really value that. And, and which is why there's no regulation on it with the SEC or no oversight. So therefore, uh, people that's licensed can't really deal in Bitcoin. We can't say, hey, or in any cryptocurrency. What we what you can do, however, is invest in their platforms, like say a Coinbase, uh, which would be the equivalent of the Nasdaq or S and P for cryptocurrency. So you can invest in the companies, the, the platforms that trade it. You just can't invest as, as, a, as a financial advisor. You just can't suggest that you invest directly into uh, Bitcoin at the moment. But it has no intrinsic value. So therefore, we tend to ignore it, even though it, it, it in some cases it has made a lot of people a lot of money. But you got to look at the flip side to that, too. It's cost a lot of people a lot of money as well. You know, it got to that record high of 69, 70,000 per Bitcoin, whatever that means. And then there was regulation that came about in China that restricted its use some, and it dropped all the way down to nineteen, twenty thousand or such, and now it's back up. It's very volatile. It's unpredictable. Therefore, in, in our world, we don't recommend it, and we don't deal with it. And, and I'm, I, not to, I'm not asking about the wisdom of this. I'm just trying to understand the concept of it. And maybe if not to you, then the others in the room here. If if where does that eighty thousand dollars go? And then, if I want to buy something with the Bitcoin, am I drawing down on my eighty thousand dollars? To yes. yes, you can buy some things that you can purchase on Bitcoin. It's just converted back to cash when you when you purchase it. But uh, so your cash may become worth more money if you invest in Bitcoin. But that's about as much as I know about it. So Bill or Rob or any listeners. Are experts on Bitcoin. If they'd fill me in on it, I would be more educated well, as well. Well, the, the troublesome aspect of it, other than what it's backed by, uh, which is air, your belief that it's worth something, uh, is that as you transact with it, you incur capital gains based on what yes. the worth of it was when you purchased it versus when you used it. And therefore, every time you purchase something, you may be subjecting yourself to a taxable transaction which we don't do with the dollar. Now, the value of the dollar fluctuates every minute. But when I spend my dollar, if it's now worth more than what it was worth when I got the dollar, I don't have to claim that on my income taxes as a capital gain because the dollar is worth more today than it was yesterday. And likewise, if it's worth less, I don't get to file that as uh, a loss, a capital gains loss. So I, I'm not sure why we treat Bitcoin differently from a tax perspective than the dollar if it's a spendable currency of, of, of sorts, but it is. And that well, alone it's would-, would... Back, It's converted back to cash, and that conversion back to cash is what causes the capital gain. No, really no different than a stock. So if I bought a share of NVIDIA at $50, $50 a share and it grew to 300, and then I converted that back to cash so I could go buy something with it, what, regardless of what that purchase is. Now I have a capital gain on that 250 And that's kind of the same premise with Bitcoin. So if you bought some or, or a piece of Bitcoin in the same scenario, it does get converted back to cash, as I understand anyway. It gets converted back to cash during that purchase. It's just all one fell swoop where you're saying, okay, I'm going to, this costs 300 Bitcoin. It's still in reality getting converted back to cash. Phil, instead of using Nvidia, let's use Tesla as the. I was going to come to that <laughs> as an example because <laughs> Tesla this morning is up again another twenty percent, I believe it is. It is now at three hundred and forty twenty dollars. I'm sorry, three hundred and forty two dollars uh, per share for for Tesla, which I think you probably got to go back about three years when it was at that uh, value or close to it before. Elon Musk bought Twitter, and then the stock went to hell for <laughs> about two straight years. It just kept dropping in value. But now it sure is up, and this is really 
booting, uh, uh, boot, the price is being boosted because of Elon Musk's relationship to Donald Trump, the way yeah. I interpret yeah. this. Yeah. Before yeah. you answer, let me ask my hypothetical question. Uh, since the election, uh, Tesla, prior to the day, was up over 30 uh, percent. Would that have been the same case if the election gone the other way? I no, I don't so. think it would have yeah. been, Bill, in that scenario because of now the relationship between Elon Musk and Donald Trump. I think when he won, the perception is that there's going to be uh, fewer regulations on Tesla than what they would have been before and maybe even a propensity. If you really think about uh, the, 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 those that supported uh, that support Trump, by and large, they weren't ones that you would expect to buy an electric vehicle. You've never seen, and I'm not saying that Republicans couldn't buy an electric vehicle, but, but if you saw an electric vehicle going down the road, you would probably be a better than a 75% chance that that was a Democrat and they did not support Donald Trump. But now with their relationship, I think what is viewed as there may be more support from the government for Tesla or EVs altogether, and it may even open up a section of consumers that wouldn't have considered it before. But there is a ton, uh, just it goes without saying, of momentum, momentum toward Tesla because of the election uh, with with Tesla and his relationship with Donald Trump, Elon Musk's relationship with Donald Trump. Bring it on. Bring it on. I think it's Toyota <laughs> that sometime within the next year is coming out with a new battery technology, which would allow the battery charge to last up to 800 miles, whereas most of these, uh, what are they, lithium batteries? Uh, yeah. They are right now capped around 350 miles. 400, yes. Uh -huh. So this could be a game changer in the battery uh, market for electric vehicles because EVs, they're, they're kind of reaching their ceiling in terms of who wants to get one because of the anxiety over the battery life and the lack of enough charging stations around uh, the, the country for a big drive. Yeah, you're talking about battery life and, ta and for one charge, not the battery life for the long longevity Correct. of the Correct, not battery, the longevity yeah. of the because battery. Because they can last for several, several, several years. Yeah. Which currently, one battery life lasts about as long as a full tank of gas, if you really look at it. And I think that's the premise behind 400 miles. I don't care what kind of car you have. It's in that neighborhood yeah. of 400 miles per tank. And I think that's where that, that, pers that, that concept came up with. And Toyota changing that. It could make people feel better that live in rural areas and they don't have a charging station that nearby or they have to go out of their way. If it's doubled in time or distance, then maybe they can uh, wait a little bit longer to, to – to charge up or they can go on longer trips and not have to worry about stopping it. Right? Yeah, one of the significant impediments to buying an EV is the recharging anxiety. Sure. Even though that proves, in most cases, proves not to be the case as long as you're along a major network of highways. And you have a Tesla. And you have a Tesla. Which has a <laughs> very <laughs> extensive charging. In it. The right. five-year return on Tesla, for those who are interested, is 1,268%. I'm sure there's a lot of people interested. And I'll point out that, you know, it's on the NASDAQ, and it also has made its way into – it was already in a lot of mutual funds and exchange-traded funds, but that got heavier as that price dipped. So it's lifting a lot of mutual funds and exchange-traded funds probably on a, on a bigger proportion than what it was even before the Twitter purchase and the, and the drop in, in value. Financial Phil, we're just about out of time. How do we get in touch with you today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and sit with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here, Martin. Do you have a Steelers-Ravens pick you want to make right now for next Sunday? Do I need to make it already? I want to say the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to win that football game 20-10. to 10. They got Lamar Jackson's number, and me and Dylan's going to have it out next Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> the showdown throwdown. I like it.